Welcome to The Art of Charm. I'm Jordan Harbinger. The Art of Charm brings together the best coaches in the industry to teach you guys how to crush it in life, love, and at work. Imagine having a mix of experienced mentors teaching you their expertise, packing decades of research, testing, and tough lessons into a concise curriculum. We've created one of the premier men's lifestyle programs available anywhere, and it's free. This is the show we wish we had a decade ago. This show is about you, and we're here to help you become the best man you can be in every area of your life. Make sure to stay up to date with everything going on here and get some killer free ebooks as well as drills and exercises that'll help you become more charismatic and confident by signing up for the newsletter at theartofcharm.com. If you're new to the show but you want to know more about what we teach here at The Art of Charm, listen to the toolbox at theartofcharmpodcast.com slash toolbox. That's where you'll get the fundamentals of dating and attraction such as body language, eye contact, vocal tonality, all that stuff that's more important than you might think. We've got boot camps running every single month here in California. Details at theartofcharm.com, and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you guys here at The Art of Charm. Enjoy. Today we've got a good one. We're talking to Tucker Max, best-selling author. He's sold millions of books. We're going to talk about why he actually retired from the party animal way of life, some emotional pain in Tucker's childhood and growing up Tucker Max and what that was like, emotional promiscuity and how it fills a hole in our psyche, the layers in Tucker's writing and how we see those over time and at different ages, some parenting advice from Tucker Max of all people, and what happens to you is not your fault, but what you do with that afterwards is in your hands, and why emotional health is one of the most important things in any relationship. Tucker Max, without further ado. I hadn't before a few days ago read your stuff since probably law school, and I actually met you in law school. I met you and Kung Fu Mike, and we got ridiculously inebriated at some shitty bar in Ann Arbor. And so I sort of had you freeze-framed as that person. Doing my homework for the show after talking with Ryan Holiday and Charlie Hone, I see something now much more interesting. So I want to dive into that, and hopefully that's cool. I mean, you've been the best-selling author. You've sold more than a million books, but now you've sort of retired from the party lifestyle. Looking back now, your, your website's still up. Still, my name is Tucker Max, and I'm an asshole. How do you feel about that old persona even being up there? I mean, do you get like a gut reaction when you read that, or are you still that person? I'm obviously not the person I was when I was 27. I mean, I'm 39 now. I wrote, I am Tucker Max, and I'm an asshole, like 12 years ago. I'll, I'll put it this way. If anyone is the same 12 years in a row, then that person's pretty sad. You know? Yeah, I would I mean, agree. If you don't change and grow and develop, something's wrong. You know, I'm no different. I would definitely agree with that. And of course, the show that we have here is all about growing up. And our show grew up as well from going out there and getting chicks and then realizing that was, you know, an empty pursuit as well as that the people were teaching it were largely full of shit to growing the whole man, which is kind of where we are now. And it seems like you're going along a similar path. I mean, in your last book, Hilarity Ensues, you wrote that you're retiring from this type of writing. And for people that don't really know or aren't familiar with your writing, just an example of that is there's a story that I just remember clear as day, probably read it at almost a decade now, where you were having anal sex with a girl who ended up accidentally shitting on you, and then your friend who was secretly filming in the closet burst out of the closet vomiting, and it kind of just like turned into this giant, disgusting, depraved situation. And I mean, it's still kind of funny, but to look back on that type of thing you've actually been doing big changes over the years. What is it that made you make the leap from boy to man other than, of course, the time elapsed in that process? Let's unpack a lot of the assumptions in that question. First off, time elapsing doesn't cause change. Exactly. Well, I know a lot of people actually who haven't changed really at all in their lives. They've gotten older and some things have changed around them, but they haven't really changed, right? So it has nothing to do with time. I don't really like to phrase it as transforming from boy to man mm -hmm. because I don't know to me that that marginalizes or you know puts down the stuff I've done and what I've accomplished whether it's good or bad but like it's not about that dude it's about like okay so for instance when I retired from sort of writing frat tire the media and I mean all media whether it was total frat move or Jezebel or everyone in between Huffington Post, New York Times, whatever, they kind of didn't know what to make of it because what are the media narratives for something like this? Well, there's the main narrative, which is, oh, he's reformed and changed, right? And I was like, no, my answer to that is I haven't reformed because what was deformed about me before? I rejected the reform notion because I didn't accept the implication that I needed to be reformed. 
I liked what I was doing when I was doing it, right? And were there problems with it and, you know, were parts of it maybe foolish, et cetera? Of course. That doesn't devalue what I was doing. You know, the, the example I always use is, you know, kids play with dolls when they're eight. And of course they don't play with dolls when they're 18, but it doesn't mean that dolls are bad. It means dolls are part of a development process that makes sense for a certain age and a certain time. Now, when you're playing with dolls at 18 or 28, maybe that's when you have a problem, right? Uh huh. Okay, so I think what I did in my 20s is what a lot of guys do, a lot of girls too, a lot of people do. And I think it's totally normal. And I think, in fact, it's actually a good thing in certain ways. Now, did I take some things to extremes a little bit? Did I, you know, whatever, do a lot of stupid things, et cetera? Yeah, probably, but whatever. That's how you learn. That's experience comes from bad decisions. Sure. You know, I mean, that's how you make good decisions, right? Is you get experience and how you get experience, you make bad decisions. So in no way, shape or form do I regret or do I think that I was a little boy or, I mean, of course I was immature at times. Fuck, dude, I'm kind of immature now sometimes. So I don't know how much of that has changed. The transformation came for no other reason than I was no longer fulfilled by the things I was doing at that time in my life. There's nothing else. It wasn't about like, oh, I'm bad or I'm wrong or I'm deformed or I have to grow up or I have to do this. No, I would never do anything because I thought I had to. I do things because I want to, because they make sense, because of the right thing to do, because they're what I think I should be doing, you know, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. There was no moment, dude. It was just sort of like at some point getting drunk five nights a week and picking up girls and being like a crazy 25 year old just wasn't fun anymore. And so it was like, okay, that was fun for a long time. And now it's not fun. So let me go find something else that's fun, you know, or or that's fulfilling. And so now that I'm 38, I found a whole new sort of bevy of things that are fulfilling that have little to do with what I used to do, but I think are fantastic. And you know what? At 48, I'm probably going to have different things. You know? Right. No more dolls, right? Proverbial right. dolls. Well, well, I stopped playing with G.I. Joe's when I was about, I don't know, 11 or 12. You know, and then I moved on to like sports and then girls. And now I'm playing with startups, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we'll get into that for sure. I definitely want to talk about that. Now, looking back at sort of the past writing that you've done, I mean, a lot of people, especially when I talk with Ryan Holiday, he's even turned this around to your benefit, especially when the movie came out that a lot of people are offended by it and it's labeled as misogynistic and there's a lot of people that can't stand it and there's a hell of a lot more people that love it. When you look at your writing as a whole, do you look at it as something that you needed to get out of me? I know that you wrote because it was hilarious and you wrote because people told you to and then you wrote because it was a business. It seems like whenever you're going out and doing something that eventually turns out to be to an extreme, there's obviously some sort of need that needs to be filled. Looking back on it now... Do you feel like you were fulfilling a need that wasn't there? I mean, do you have like some childhood paradigm that wasn't working or that resulted in that behavior? What do you think about that? I mean, does that strike a chord? Because most people, even extreme party people that I know that I grew up with, they never took it to your level, which is one of the reasons why your writing is so epic. The last part of your question, I'm actually not quite sure I agree. I'm sure like, you know, what you said is factually true from your life. I'm just talking about like, I actually don't think what made my writing epic was that the stories were so unusual because, dude, it honestly didn't even occur to me when I was writing these that the stories themselves were epic because this was what all my friends and I were doing. And I know a ton of people who do stuff exactly like I do. There's about mm, 5 to 10 to 12, maybe 15 that are like, that's pretty fucking amazing. Right. Actually, under 10, 10 or under that are like, that's amazing. But I wrote three books, you know, so there's probably, I don't know, I'm going to make up a number, 80 stories in those three books. Most of them are like, oh, he got drunk and fell down, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I would agree with you. He hooked up with a fat girl, you know, like there's nothing epic about that. Like a lot of them are pretty pedestrian. The reason that they became popular to be totally starkly honest and a little bit arrogant is because they're fucking really well written. Yes, that is And they're really funny. That's why they became popular. There's sort of a new generation of party heroes that are emerging now on Twitter and Instagram. And 
they're becoming famous not because of anything they've ever written, because they're fucking morons, but because they go out and get crazy drunk and do crazy things, and then they take pictures of it, uh, and then they put them on Instagram or Twitter or wherever. Uh, they're mostly dudes. I guess there are some girls. But a lot of them, they do shit that's way more epic in certain ways than I ever did, mm-hmm. right? But I don't want to say they're just taking pictures of it. To, like I'm not trying to marginalize that, but they're just about the event. There's no sort of context or story. They're not creating anything out of the event. They're just recording an event. And so the only thing that they have is, oh, my event was this. And that you know was amazing because of these hot girls and whatever, an ice sculpture or whatever the fuck they're taking pictures of, right? That, I think, is a lot of how a lot of people look at me. You know, he just did crazy things, and that's why he's awesome. But that's just not the case at all. There are a lot of people who hung out with me, and they're like, yeah, like, it was a good time. We had an amazing night, but, like, it's not something I would ever think about writing about. Like, it's way less epic than I thought your life would be. And then I, I would go write the story about it, and they'd be like, okay, this story's fucking hilarious, and it's all true, but it's, like, so much cooler to read about than I, I remember, and I was there, you know? <laughs> sure. That sort of happens a lot, right? I think the first part of your question is totally separate. The first part is um, about, like, emotional changes in me and, like, have I recognized pain in myself that caused me to act a certain way in my 20s now Maybe that I wasn't recognizing then? You're absolutely on point. I definitely have a linear path to that. But you essentially, yeah, exactly. You kind of nailed my next question or one of my next questions, which was, was there emotional pain in your childhood or wherever that caused you to go to such extremes, especially with women? I mean, what was growing up Tucker Max like? All right. So um, the short answer is yes, of course, right? Because there's no sort of either extreme behavior or what I like to call behavioral promiscuity, not necessarily meaning sleeping around a lot. Right. But like if if you do anything to an extreme, alcohol, women or men, if you're either gay or a woman, whatever, drugs, gambling, shopping, it doesn't matter. Any addiction or any addictive type behavior or even any behavior that sort of like keeps you occupied and busy The point of that behavior is very rarely the actual object itself, but the behavior is used as a salve to either run from, avoid, or minimize emotional pain. The best example, did you ever watch the show Intervention? I did, yeah. Of course, everyone's seen like the world's worst cry or whatever video, and then you got to watch the show. Dude, it's fucking amazing. It's one of the best shows, I think, in the history of TV, along with, like, the first 48, and if we're talking about, like, non-scripted shows, Mm -hmm. it is amazing. But I don't know if you noticed, watching the show, that every single show, almost, had the exact same pattern. Like, you could have replaced the addiction of the person. Sometimes it was kind of cool, like, this person's addicted to, like, you know, paint thinner or whatever, some crazy shit you would never fucking right. think about. You'd never like put that, in your body. Right, right. So the details were always different. Like, holy shit, this person did this. This person, like, I can't believe how bad their family is or I can't believe they're addicted to this or whatever. The details were different. But the underlying patterns were always the same. This was the pattern. The person had some trauma, usually in their childhood, but not always, that was so awful and so difficult for them to deal with And they had no either support system around them or willingness or ability to deal with the trauma head on or in a functional way. So they use some sort of addiction to avoid or run from or hide the pain. Yes. That's what addiction is. And like we kind of have this idea that addiction is like a physical, biological, like a medical issue. Right. That's not false, but it's not really in any way the whole story. Which is why if it was just a medical issue, you could just go into, you know, if you're a heroin addict, just go into medical sort of detox and then come out and you're fine. Right. You wouldn't have any desire. Right. There's a reason that incessant immersive talk therapy over an extended period of time because all addiction is about emotional pain always in every way. And the physical component is usually the least important and easiest to deal with. Right. And so, like, I'm sure you know workaholics and you know people who are, like, just constantly busy. Even if they're not busy, they make something. Oh, yeah. Charlie Hone, for one, right? Charlie used to be that way. Charlie actually, like, I don't want to call him my roommate, 
because he doesn't pay any rent. <laughs> the mooch that lives on my floor. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I have a huge place, so I have like plenty of extra bedrooms. He like lives in my place. He was always supposed to be there for like a few weeks. <laughs> and he's, I don't even know. What's funny is he's such a good dude and he's so pleasant to be around. I honestly couldn't tell you how long he's been at my place. And Charlie's that changed a lot. But if you think of addiction as a way to hide from or run from or bury emotional trauma and emotional pain, then that's what it is. So circling back to the original question, yeah, mm-hmm. of course, dude. There's no way I can understand that and be like, oh, no, I'm different. Here's the three reasons why because that would be the most bullshit of all bullshit rationalizations. So in my specific case, you know, we could spend a lifetime almost talking about the details of my issues. For the most part, probably not hard to figure out. Like I had a father who was never really there. My parents were divorced when I was a year and a half. And my father's very narcissistic, a very archetypical baby boomer. Mother is, is very much the same way, except she's crazy in a lot of ways. And I don't mean that in a funny, oh, is it my family crazy way. I mean it like kind of an unfun, oh, it sucks that my mom is such a, a crazy person. It's unfun. And so I grew up in a household where my parents weren't bad people. Like they never hit me. I always had plenty of food. You know, no one put anything up my butt or whatever when I was a kid. <laughs> okay. Because like there's a narrative that that's what abuse is. Right. Right. Sure. And of course that is abuse. But there's a whole sea of abuse that is not physical, sexual, or fundamental human need based, you know, like it's not the bottom of Maslow's pyramid. You can abuse on multiple layers above. And my parents, they weren't around a whole lot when I was a kid. They weren't critical, but they weren't super supportive. And they also weren't, they weren't very emotionally connected to me. But the reality is, is because they weren't emotionally connected to themselves. So it's not like they were just great people and said, you know what, let's fuck this kid up. Yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. They were just fucked up. Hey guys, I want to take a quick break for a second here. You've heard me talk a lot about taking you to the next level in life, at work, and in your relationships. And you've also thought to yourself, yeah, I do want to up my game. I want to become a better man, a better boyfriend or husband, a better person in general. And my guess is that you've been thinking about this for a long time. Am I right? Well, I'm here to tell you this. Stop thinking. Your chance is now. Do you really need more time, more information, more plans for the future, or do you want to become that guy today? Because the truth is this. You can be the guy who sits around and thinks about becoming better, or you can be the guy who decides that today is the day to become become awesome and take action in that direction. And I want that for you. Why? Because you've already got what it takes. The potential is there even if you don't know it yet. Join me and thousands of guys who've taken action in their lives at theartofcharm.com. All right, let's get back to the show. Fucked up people can't have good relationships. You have good relationships because you basically have your shit together for the most part, right? At least one side of the relationship has their shit together, usually both sides of the relationship, right? Of course. But it's very difficult for a child to be the stable side of a relationship because it's a fucking child. Yeah, you you don't have the background, you don't have the emotional strength to deal with that because the infrastructure is not in place. Because you're a fucking child! Exactly. Right. Right, that's the point of parents, actually, The only thing that parents really have to do to be great parents, like you can fuck almost everything up and do this right and your kid's still going to come out okay and love you and you're going to be a good parent. You have to unconditionally love and support your kid. People say they do that. Like I bet my parent – well, my dad's. I don't think it's stupid enough. I bet my mom would argue that she did that. Not only did she not do that, she did like the opposite of all of that. Parenting's not about you. It's about how much you love and connect with that kid. Which doesn't mean you give them everything. Of course, you know, just like not being there enough and not giving enough to your kid is a form of abuse. Giving too much, indulging and spoiling is also another form of abuse. The point is you need to love and accept and care for them unconditionally because they'll never get that anywhere else ever. Even if they meet an amazing person, get married, whatever, it's not going to be unconditional. The only other place they're going to get that is if they're a parent and they're not getting it, they're giving it. It's a very unique relationship. And if you don't have that as a kid from your parents, at least one of them, but preferably both, depending on what the rest of your childhood was like and what your parents were like in other ways, it can create a lot of problems for you later on. And yeah, I think, you know, without going too far into details, you can't take normal behavior to extreme without it being in some form or another a defense or a compensation for 
unresolved traumas and emotional issues, usually from your childhood, right? Sure. Especially if I'm doing shit in my 20s, it's from my childhood. It's not like my friend killed himself at 18 and everything was perfect before then and now I'm going to go fuck a bunch of girls, you know? Now, how aware were you of all this in the midst of the 20s thing? Were you like, yeah, you know, I had this childhood issue. I mean, is there some sort of point at which you started getting awareness? Are you in therapy now for this? Or when you were in your 20s, did you have no clue? I mean, where were you kind of on that spectrum? You know, it's one of those things where it's like as a kid, like I'm talking about myself in, the, in my 20s. Sure. But I'm just saying, if you went back and read I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell right now, you would be shocked at how different it was to you. Because at 24... If you read my books, you're going to only take the top layer, maybe a little bit of the second layer. At 34, you're at least going to get the top two layers and probably most of the third layer. The top layer is just the obvious, the fart jokes, the shit jokes. Oh, he fucking got drunk. Oh, he fucked the fat girl, right? The second layer is the sort of self-mocking, sarcasm, tongue-in-cheek, uh, nod in a wink type. The, the stuff that requires cultural context that kids in their teens and 20s don't get, but everyone 28 and above usually gets some of my stuff. The third layer, it's more, much more subtle, and I think you have to be someone who went through this to, to get it, although I could be wrong. It's very much like, oh, wow, this dude is in pain and knows he's in pain, and this is how he's resolving the pain, the extreme behavior, but either isn't ready or isn't willing to address that head on, and this is so fun. So he's going to go keep doing that. There's maybe 10 places in Beer and Hell where you can see that come through crystal clear, but they're very short and they're very quick and they're very subtle. And you have to, you have to be in a place where you can see them. And I bet if you went back and looked at it now, you'd see them all clear as day. Yeah. There, there were a couple of things that shine through that I remember even now that are not exactly on that vein, but very similar. There was one story and I can't even believe I remember this, but I guess you were sleeping with this high-end escort, like 2000 bucks a night. I didn't know she was an escort. Oh, you didn't know? Okay. She, I know exactly what you're talking about. She was fucking me. Like, I was like Disneyland for her or whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was like, I was the guy that, like, she was sort of dating. And I didn't know she was an escort. But yeah, go ahead. And I remember thinking to myself, you went, wait a minute. This girl brought over booze and then, like, had to go and bang these dudes for money. And when you realized that, you were like, holy shit. This is kind of how everything works in a microcosm inside a lot of these relationships. And I remember getting sort of this flicker of like, well, if he recognizes that and he's self-aware enough to know that, then that must actually kind of firm a, firm a paradigm that you already had in your head about relationships that wouldn't necessarily normally be considered healthy. And that's where I started to get a glimpse of like, oh, he's not just like party rock. I'm such a great guy. Look at all this cool shit I'm doing. You, you started to get awareness of this. And it started to shine through. But my question, you know, looking back on that story 10 years ago, eight years ago, is how conscious was that? But the fact that you wrote it down in there kind of answers that question for me now, being creator of material myself. You never accidentally throw something in there that's, that's meaningful. It's too hard. First off, I don't want to take credit like, oh, when I was 28, I wrote this in knowing I'd be mature later. And then, <laughs> sure, like, I, yeah. like, here's the reality is that when you create a piece of art, any creator, whether it's a painting or writing or whatever – a lot of stuff can end up in there that you don't consciously realize is going in as you're making it. Sure. You know? I honestly think that's why my stuff is so appealing to a lot of people and why it's kind of defied description for a long time in a lot of ways is because, first of all, of course, it's funny and it's like crazy, right? So that's the obvious explanation. And there's also this sort of brash sort of arrogance that's also like tongue in cheek and sort of naughty. And that's kind of fun. But I think the real emotional appeal for a lot of people is exactly what you just described. It's like there is a raw honesty there, and it doesn't come through a lot, but it comes through enough that you realize, wow, he's not just some idiot talking about how awesome he is all the time. Like he recognizes fully, at least on a deep level, a lot of the absurdities and the pain and the other issues, but like he is too young and too inexperienced to address them. And so it's like you have this sort of like, it looks like a comedy, but in a way it behaves emotionally like a tragedy. Yeah. And you can only have that if the writing is very emotionally honest. I can go back and read my stuff now and I can be like, wow. Like I can see what I'm saying and then be like, oh, wow. I know what I was feeling then and I know it much clearer. Mm -hmm. But like I didn't put that in on purpose. Oh, I'm going to put in this really subtle thing. Let's see if anyone picks it up or whatever. Like I'm not Melville or something. Right. No, of course. 
it was just a function of me knowing that the only thing I had in my writing, I had two things that made it work, humor and honesty. And whenever I came to a point where it's like I had trouble with something or I didn't know what it, it, I would always stop and ask myself, well, what's the fucking truth? Yes. The, especially the emotional truth. Like the truth of the events, of course that's important. But like when you're writing a story, it's like, my God, dude, if I wrote the exact truth of everything that happened, it would be 2,000 pages. It'd be like a forensic report. It'd be fucking awful. No, who yeah. would read that? No, I'm talking about the emotional truth. And so I would always – Focus clear as day, even before I understood what the full emotional truth was. What did I feel? No matter how hard it was to write it down, I would put that in. And so, like, that resonates with people, even if they don't understand precisely why it resonates. It gives voice to things that people feel. You know, I think there's a lot of people that have the same sort of issues as I do. My parents were selfish shits, they weren't bad people, but they sucked as parents. And, you know, everyone's specific stories are different. And, you know, maybe I drink and hook up with girls or do this or do that as a way of dealing with that pain. And, and it's not the best way, but I don't know what else to do. And it's also kind of fun and fucked up. And here it is. And so I kind of like presented that experience, which a lot of people share in a way that resonated with those people. Yeah, and that makes sense. And that's why people who read this who don't have those similar experiences aren't necessarily even just living vicariously through you. Sure, some guys are, but some guys are identifying with something they can't quite put their finger on. Yes, with the emotional undercurrent. You right. know, like, dude, Ryan Holiday is a perfect example. Like, he and I couldn't be more different. Like, that dude, like, I, I'm literally not sure if possibly the only girl he's ever been with in his life is his current fiance. And if it's not her, <laughs> right. it's like maybe one or two other girls, right? Yeah. And I don't say that as a put down. I'm just saying, like, I don't know if he's had 10 drinks in his whole life. Like, he hates going to parties, whatever. But he connected with my books on a deep level because he has parents who are shitty in the same way that mine are, or in a very similar way. And he experiences a lot of the same emotions. My stuff is very emotional. If you actually dig into it and look at it that way, it's actually very emotional. And he's a perfect example. The fact that that kid who is 10 years younger than me and totally opposite of me in every way, he resonated with my writing very highly. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it would be impossible. And you've sold over a million books. There just probably aren't enough guys doing similar things or wanting to do similar things that you were doing back then to sell that many books unless people could relate in a way that wasn't exactly just on the surface level. There had to be deeper stuff there, and people get that. I know when I was reading it, I wasn't thinking, man, I wish I did that, and I certainly wasn't actually doing that stuff. I liked it for a totally different set of reasons, mostly now 2020 hindsight. I didn't know what it was back then, but you're super self-aware, which I think people really dig because everybody wants more of that. Yeah, in their own life, no doubt. Yeah. As a side note, because I am still a little bit arrogant, I've actually sold three million books. Not oh, you one have? Million. Oh, sorry about that. So much for fucking Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, but another good sort of proof of what you just said, about half my fans are women. Exactly. I was going to bring that up. That's a good point. Right. And you can chalk some of that up to, you know, girls connecting with bad boys or whatever. But the reality is the vast majority of my female fans don't want to sleep with me. It's much more about they connect with the emotional truths underlying the book. So it's not just a male thing. These yeah. are deep emotional truths. They're deep human truths that I sort of tap into and fit into a cultural context that connects with a lot of people, men and women. And no big surprise, women are generally about a billion times more self-aware than any guy. So, and usually more emotionally intelligent, too, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, we talked a little bit before about kids and parents. I mean, do you plan on having kids? Is that something that's on your horizon? <laughs> yeah, of course. That's awesome. And so, obviously, the plan is do shit differently uh, than your parents did, goes without saying. What sort of steps are you taking you know, there's all that psychologically, I don't really know a lot about it, but I'm sure that abused parents, you know, raised abused kids and the cycle perpetuates and that's there's that whole narrative. I'm assuming that you're doing a lot to make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, what's funny is not really, it's not like I'm reading all these fucking parenting books and all this shit. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm actually not. Because of what I said to, earlier in the podcast is what you have to do to be a great parent is unconditionally love and accept your kid. And that doesn't require a lot of skill or practice. That's an emotional connection, which a retarded human being can do. Yeah. No, I mean, seriously. Yeah, yeah, like, no. 
if I need to read a book about how to love and connect, then I'm not going to be able to love and connect. <laughs> I got a lot of fucking work to do, dude. Sure. You know, that being said, indirectly, I have done a ton of work to make that happen. And so, but not in the context of being a parent. Working so, on yourself generally. Actually, not very generally, specifically. I'll explain what I mean. I don't know if you read the Forbes piece. When Hilarity and Seuss came out, which is sort of like my final book, Forbes did a huge profile of me. The piece where I like kind of officially retired and I talked about why I was getting out of frat tire and stuff. And in that piece, I talked about how I had started uh, psychoanalysis, which is like just a form of talk therapy. And it's funny. It's like all these people were like had all these goofy opinions about it. And that was maybe I was six months in at that point. I'm now three years in. It's helped me immensely deal with the exact issues that we just got done talking about. So here's the thing. Whatever your emotional issues are, even if you had traditionally abusive appearance or you had some horrible thing happen to you in high school or whatever, what happened to you isn't your fault. But what happens afterwards, what you do with that is up to you. I was dealt a certain hand. Some cards were good. Some cards were not good. And it's like what I do with that hand is up to me. And I decided that I wasn't going to be miserable I wasn't going to leave these traumas and these emotional issues unresolved in my life. And so there's a lot of different ways you can deal with your trauma and you can deal with your pain. You can deal with your problems. So I'm not trying to say psychoanalysis is the only way. It works really well for a certain type of person dealing with certain types of issues. I started three years ago and it's been great for me. It's helped my relationships. It's helped me understand myself. It's helped me understand why I do certain things. It's helped me understand my unconscious. And it's like, okay, I get it. And so now I'm much better equipped to have sort of connected, meaningful relationships with anybody, but a with, with uh, a kid. So to answer your question, yes, I actually have done a lot of work, but none of it was work about parenting. All of it was work on making sure that I deal with my problems so that my problems don't go any further than me. Exactly. My problems are not going to go into my kid. Yes. That's obviously what I was getting at with that as well, because that's the greatest gift that you can give to your future children, right? Is to make sure that they're insulated from that. Sort of. I would phrase it that the best gift I can give to my kids is unconditional acceptance and love. I didn't really get, and I wouldn't have been able to give them if I hadn't sort of changed that pattern. But yeah, like... All right, let's take a quick time out for a sec. Some people think the Art of Charm boot camps and programs are just about picking up girls. And honestly, there's some of that. One week with us and you'll be rocking out in that department, I promise. But as a guy, I know how important it is to be awesome and well-rounded. And not just awesome with girls. Awesome at work, awesome at home, awesome with your friends and family. Guys really need to step it up everywhere. And that's why we call our company the Art of Charm. That special something that gets you results wherever you go. And trust me, the results are real. Every day I get new emails and calls from the guys who decided to take our boot camp. And what I hear is simply amazing. Just weeks after graduating, they land a promotion, they form a new wolf pack, start a new business, or even find a partner. They have a new life, and it's not an accident. Find out why at theartofcharm.com. All right, let's get back to the good stuff. I think I'm going to be, in terms of functional parenting stuff, I actually think I'm going to be a great parent. I'm sort of a natural teacher. I love doing it. But I'm sure, of course, there'll be a thing that I'll fuck, that I'll fuck up and you know, I won't know how to change a diaper or what the fuck ever. <laughs> That's, I mean, that shit doesn't matter. That's logistical shit, man. Right, right, exactly. Anyone can do that. Like, there are a lot of really stupid people who do that. And so I figure I should be able to figure that out. Yeah, look at the other types of people that raise kids and they turn out mo sometimes just fine. I think you'll be okay. Right. This is just not a function of intelligence. Emotional health and intelligence are, um, they're just not the same thing and they're not even closely related in a lot of ways. It sounds weird to say, but they're just not. So what I've done is just really focus on my emotional stuff. They may have their own problems. In fact, I know everyone has problems. They'll have their own problems and I'll make emotional mistakes, but I'm going to make them on top of the bedrock of unconditional love and acceptance. And so all those mistakes, it'd be much easier to correct and deal with and accommodate than if that wasn't there. Sure. I mean, that goes without saying. It's absolutely spot on. So speaking of kids, I'm guessing that you want a partner to raise them with? Uh, I was just hoping to grow them in a, in a test you know, tube, in a, a bread machine or something. A laboratory? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course, dude. Of course. Absolutely. What are you looking for in, in a partner? Because it's it's almost funny to 
read the book in in one day and then the next day talk about what Tucker Max is looking for in, in a potential wife or mother of, of his children. What do you look for in in a partner, in a life partner? What do I look for in a life partner? Um, I mean, you have all these external accomplishments, right? A lot of that's not going to mean shit unless you are in a meaningful relationship. Do you agree with that? Yes and no. I, I wouldn't phrase it like that. I don't, see, I don't see the two things as interacting with each other in a lot of ways. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, like, I get a lot of questions for advice from kids and whatever. And the questions they ask are never the questions that they want answered because they're not wise enough to know what the real questions are. Of course. So you have to sort of learn how to dig into their assumptions. This is always one of those assumptions where people are like, oh, what should I do with my life? And, and should I focus more on this? What about this girl? And whatever. And then you have to kind of dig in the assumptions. This is another one of those questions. So the way I always phrase is, is I tell kids, look, the only two things you do that matter, that really matter, are the relationships you have with the people you love and the things you do that matter to other people, right? That's it. Nothing else matters. And I don't think I figured that out until my early 30s. You know, and, you know, and I don't think it really sunk in until 34, 35. So very recent in my life did, did that really, really imbue itself into not just my intellect, but my emotional intelligence and stuff. As a result, if you understand those two things, then I think kind of how you make decisions about your life fundamentally changes, right? And I know it has for me. I know in my early mid to late 20s and early 30s, the decisions of my life were about accomplishments about exactly what you just said, all these things I've done, right? And then as I realized, as I did a bunch of things and I got all this money and I had all this status and whatever, and I still wasn't happy, I realized, wow, that shit's not going to make me happy. Like, it's not like that stuff is irrelevant, but it's just not, it hasn't changed my emotional baseline, hasn't solved them. Problems. So obviously that shit doesn't really matter. And that, well, what matters? Relationships and the things you do that, that matter to other people. So it's like, so... From that point, that's when I really focused on relationships. And then I started thinking about exactly what the question you just asked. What do I look for? You know, what am I looking for in women? What am I looking for in whatever? And you know what's funny, dude, is, of course, I I did the same thing everyone does, is like I've put together a list of what I want my partner to be. What do I want in a woman? Whatever. And then I realized I was making the same mistake that every ridiculous teenage girl makes. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Where it's like the girl's like, Oh, I want a boyfriend who's who likes this music and blah blah blah. And then you know it, she, right? She has a list of like seventy fucking things that she wants in a guy. And you look at her and you're like, "Fuck, or fuck, or fuck, are you talking about?" There's no guy on earth who likes all these things. A and B. None of this shit matters, right? Right. But of course, she's a seventeen year old girl, so you don't expect her to know anything at all. All seventeen year old girls are idiots, right? Just like seventeen year old guys. Sure, are idiots. sure. And then I realized though, I was doing the same thing. I mean, I didn't have a list about like, oh, you know, what music she has to like, but it was the same fucking thing. So I, I kind of changed it around. I'm like, all right, what, what does she like as a person? What does she like? What's her emotional maturity level, et cetera, et cetera. And then I realized at about 33, 34, I kind of got a really good picture in my head of who this person is and the things that matter. And then I realized, fuck, man, this girl is an awesome, awesome girl. And I want to date her and maybe marry her. And I would bet that she doesn't want me because first of all, I had met a lot of girls like that in my life. Like the, the girl, I had, I had a picture, I had a couple models in my head of girls, uh, models of, of what these girls were like. Cause I've met them and a couple of them I can remember, like I'd probably dated a couple in my early twenties, but I was nowhere near mature enough to figure it out. And then a couple of them were either my friend's wives or just amazing girls I met. And all of them were like, the look that they all gave me was like, this guy is awesome and funny and smart and this and that, but fuck, he's a mess to deal with, you know? Right. And they, they were kind of right, at least at that point in my life. And so I realized, you know what? If I want the awesome woman that I'm envisioning in my head, then I need to be the awesome guy that she wants to be with. Here's the thing, Jordan. I had all the external awesome things. Right. You know? Like if you were looking at me three years ago externally – I was one of the most eligible bachelors in a fucking America. But the external shit kind of doesn't matter if it's not matched up with the emotional intelligence that allows you to have a really connected, healthy relationship. And I didn't quite have that at that point in my life. So that's another thing analysis helped me with is understand 
what was I missing? How could I sort of fix myself so I would have that and put myself in the position to when I met one of these amazing girls? Because there aren't a lot of them, but they exist. And when I met them, would I be at the point? I was already in their league. But was I at the emotional point in my life where I could have a good relationship with them? There's no girl I'm meeting that's out of my league, right? right? The question is not, is she in my league? The question is, am I emotionally mature enough to have a relationship with a woman? Because the woman I had envisioned in my mind is very emotionally mature. So I had to like put myself in that position, you know, and then I did. Here's the irony is I'm actually sitting, I'm in a hotel room in Philadelphia right now going to a conference, but... My girlfriend's with me. I'm actually sitting on the bed next to her right now. Like I have kind of made these changes and then uh, they were almost all internal, almost all emotional things, almost all having to do with how I connected with people and how I had relationships because it's not like it was terrible. It just wasn't fully functional. I had issues with having healthy relationships. I don't want to say I fixed them, but I at least recognized them and I began to work on them. And then I met a girl who was amazing. Dude, even maybe six months before I met her, I could almost hear the conversation in my head. She'd be like, this guy's great and he's amazing, but like, I don't know if he's dateable. Yeah, you know? what am I in for? Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. Like, and don't get me wrong. We've had moments that were like very difficult for us uh, in terms of like emotionally or whatever, but it's like, we have an emotionally mature foundation where we can work through our differences and work through our issues. And I've, I've had to learn how to be a boyfriend. I've had to learn how to have relationships. I mean, I've God knows 80% of this relationship. I didn't know how to have before we had it, but I was at least in the position where I could recognize the things I was doing wrong and then recognize maybe sort of a path to fix them. Obviously she's pretty patient and she's pretty mature too. And we work through them together and you know, she had issues of her own too, but she's a woman. So She's going to be more emotionally mature than me. Sure. Unless I find a girl who's 22 or something. I don't recommend that. Yeah. (laughs) No, 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 no. We're almost on the exact same level emotional maturity wise. And so we kind of like grew into this together. And it was a very good situation. But the fact is I didn't change for her. I made myself into the man that I needed to be to get an amazing woman and to date an amazing woman. And I did, you know. I appreciate this because it's basically the entire premise of the art of charm is to help create that whole man because you need to become the type of man to get the type of woman that you want, not change into some false bozo who can trick a mediocre quality girl into into bed. But even if you do, look, dude, no one fucked more girls in their 20s than me. And I don't mean that literally. I'm sure you could find 10 or 20 or even 100 or 1,000 guys who did. But the point is, like, whatever your number is, I'm in your fucking league. You know, I may be at the end of the bench, but I'm on the team, right? (laughs) And so, like, with absolute authority, I can sit here and tell you that that shit, I'm glad I did it, and it's fucking awesome, and I'm not going to sit here and say, don't ever hook up with a bunch of girls if you want to. Bullshit. It's fucking fun. But at the same time, I don't know any guys who do that for a long amount of time or for their whole life and are happy. Of course not. And it's it's something you obviously needed to go through to get to the point at which you realize that you didn't need to do it anymore. Well, it's not need. There was a need component. I don't want to lie to myself about that. At least when I was doing it, it was more want, I think. We're saying the same thing. Yeah. Which is, if you want to do that, especially for a while, that's totally fine. And it can be fun. And it can be rewarding. And in fact, it can even be the path to happiness. But it's usually not the end goal. It's not the finish line. For at least for anyone that I've ever met who's emotionally healthy and happy, the finish line is not five girls a week. Sure. It makes a lot of sense. It's such a a breath of fresh air because, of course, people kept telling me over a long period of time to get you on the show. I just didn't want to tell dirty stories, you know, over and over as funny as they might be. I love this. I love what we created here. I think it's awesome. And uh, I appreciate the vulnerability and and the openness, the authenticity, I should say. Yeah, there's no other way for me to be, dude. I might be wrong, but I'm always going to be honest. And I'm always going to be who I am, at least at that moment, you know? I appreciate it, man. This is a great show. I wanted to originally get into, like, investing in startups and all that stuff. But I think we can maybe save it for another show. I know you've got a book coming out that's going to be about dating and, or something like that. Uh, Ryan had mentioned. I'm not sure. I mean, I'll tell you, give you a quick rundown of that. The, sure. the book is not coming till 2015. But we're doing sort of uh, very much like a whole content information ecosystem, uh, not just a book. So the book's going to be called Mate. 
it's by me and Jeffrey Miller who wrote The Mating Mind and, and Spent. And then uh, we're doing a website associated with it. It's called The Mating Grounds, thematinggrounds.com. It's actually going to cover very much a lot of the same things we talked about. I don't know how deep because it's really geared toward like 15 to 25-year-olds. And it's going to be kind of like the basics, like a basic guide to sex and dating for guys. I don't think it's going to be the same sort of stuff that we talked about here. This feels to me more like this is what you would you say to men, you know, not younger guys. Right. But it's going to cover a lot of the same basic general ideas. Hey, you want to do well with women. You want to understand yourself. You want to get your shit together. Here's the way to do it. Uh, except the approach we're going to take is going to be very systematic and very sort of scientific and very sort of evidence-based and very spelled out. Sure. Yeah, you got to spoon feed most men, myself included, let alone a 15-year-old version of me. Well, 15, definitely. Jordan, imagine if you could take everything that you know now about sex and dating women and put it into like a pamphlet because it's got to be a pamphlet for a 15-year-old. Of course. Imagine you could put it into like a pamphlet for a 15-year-old version of you. What would that book be worth? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's that's priceless knowledge that I'd want to give to any kid. Exactly. So that's what we're trying to write is the sort of book that older guys would give to younger guys that could actual wisdom and experience and knowledge that can actually help them stripped away of all the ideological agenda sort of manipulative bullshit that's out there, you know? Yeah, uh, free from other writers' emotional bullshit and like right. crappy stereotypes and, and bad experiences tainting exactly. it. Let me know when you want to start to promo that and, you know, throw me on the list. Yeah, of course, dude. I'll, yeah. I'll definitely I'll definitely do that. And definitely appreciate the time, dude. Of course, man. Thank All you. Right. Anytime, brother. Take care, Tucker. All right. Talk to you later. All right, show feedback and guest suggestions. We rely on you guys to help keep our finger on the pulse. So if you know someone who's a good fit for the show, let us know at jordanh at theartofcharm.com. Boot camp details for our live programs also at theartofcharm.com, and that's where you're going to find links to us on Twitter, Facebook, and other social media as well. If you're listening to this but you're not subscribed in iTunes or Stitcher or something like that, then that needs to change. Getting our shows delivered free to your phone or computer is the best way to make sure you don't miss a thing. You can do that by going to iTunes and searching for the Art of Charm podcast or by going to theartofcharm.com slash iTunes and clicking subscribe. That's really it. And you guys can help us. Subscribe in iTunes and give us a five-star rating. Write something nice and we will love you forever. Just go to iTunes.com slash theartofcharm and it'll take you right there. When you write us a review, it not only makes us feel proud, but it helps keep us up in the ranks so that other people who can use this information can find the show more easily to get the credible advice that they need. It's also the best way to support the show other than purchasing products and training from us. So tell your friends because the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to someone else, person, person, or shared on the web. Now have a great week. Go out there and get social and leave everything better than you found it.